Thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and, in the famous words of the post-pandemic, share my screen. And can everybody see that? Fantastic. Yes. Great. So first off, thank you everyone for coming to our sessions. Um, our session, we're doing one session, not multiple. Um, my name is Dr. Tiffany Monique Quash. I'm here with uh, Dr. Lizzie Bartelt. Um, and then Dr. Deanna Williams, who also is a part of our research team, um, was unable to join us today, but um, she is definitely a major part of this team as well. Um, and just a, oops. Here is us and Dr. Lizzie, you want to take it away? <laughs> sure do. Um, thank you everyone for having us. And I am here from outside of AU, but delighted to be here with you all today. Um, I am currently at University at Buffalo. So just to give you a little bit of background data on why we started to do this project. So the three of us met during our PhD program and got to know each other through the joys of the highs and the lows of research. And as we were doing research, we ran into some problems as most people do during research. And we found out as we listened to each other and we listened to other colleagues around campus that we knew and were friends with and talked to, that the people that tended to seem to have the most problems were those who were Black queer women. And we decided as we were on the other side of our PhDs, we should shed some light on this and talk about what was going on with that and why that was the case and whether or not that was just our experience or whether it was broader than that to see what else we could do. So to give a little bit more background here, uh, we chose a qualitative methodology because it is really important to each of us to think about how people construct the world. So for instance, um, I like to say that, you know, picture a chair, take a second, picture a chair. Okay, you all are probably thinking of something with four legs, something with a back, something with a seat. Maybe you're thinking of a rolling desk chair because that's what you're sitting on right now. But um, as somebody who grew up in the country, who grew up on a farm, um, sometimes I would be painting the fences this time of the year or whitewashing them. Think about Tom Sawyer, um, if that's a relevant example for you. But that was real life things that I had to do as a child. And we would take a break by sitting on the five gallon paint bucket and that was a chair, right? But you might not look at that and think chair but we all construct our world differently. And so in this project, we decided to unpack how we construct the world and how black queer women specifically construct the world as it relates to higher ed. So that is why we chose um, qualitative methodology. So just as a reminder of our session learning outcomes, um, the first one is to describe best practices for cultivating higher education environments that are more supportive and safer for Black queer women. Um, the second one is to explain the ways artifact elicited interviews benefited research related to this topic. And thirdly, discuss how researchers analyze the uh, impact of trauma on participants and the research team during the research process. So <clears throat> this particular workshop centers on Black queer women's and experiences interweaving the benefits of the transformative qualitative methodology used to facilitate their narratives and the implications for addressing the impact of this emotionally heavy work on the research team. A qualitative study was conducted with 19 participants. You're going to hear us repeat the number 19 time and time again um, in the United States who self-identified as Black queer women and completed a terminal degree within the last two years. So this research has definitely taken us a, a significant amount of time to complete, and we're still working through the data. Um, we will examine artifact, artifact elicited interviews as a novel research methodology and provide approaches for decolonizing the research process. 
The second portion of the workshop will explore how researchers are often unprotected while doing identity and trauma-based research and share how researchers can protect themselves from reliving trauma through the research process. The research was accepted to the conference, the Society for Scientific Study of Sexuality. So I think that's really something important for folks to note. All right, so okay. no, you're okay. Um, when we started this project, it was deeply important to us to make sure that our methods were rooted in Black feminism. You'll see a picture to the side there of Kimberly Crenshaw, who famously coined the term intersectionality. I like to always say when I teach my students about uh, Kimberly that she coined the term, but this idea had existed amongst Black feminists for and Black womanists for a very long time. And that's not to discredit Kimberly at any juncture because she is a goddess and should be revered as such. Uh, and I will hear nothing against her ever, but <laughs> I will also say that she, um, coined a term that had been knowledge within the Black female community for a long time. And so this was originally, it, she used this term to help people understand that the experiences of Black womanhood were uniquely different than those of white womanhood or Black men. And this idea that when you have intersecting marginalized identities, that compounds and changes your experience. So no longer are you simply Black, no longer are you simply a woman, but you are a Black woman. And that unique experience changes how that interplay of oppression happens and how people treat you and um, how your experience is different. So that was an important term for us and an important rooting for this project to understand the unique experiences of Black queer womanhood. We also used uh, Bell Hooks and Patricia Hill Collins, two other fabulous um, people. We did not provide their pictures, but they are also Black women, and it is very important for us to note that. If you're looking at this and you've never experienced Bell Hooks, what's your problem? Get off this call and go read a Bell Hooks book. But also, uh, she is very specific in not capitalizing her name as a way to deconstruct power. Um, and so Bell Hooks has written many, many text, a lot of them about teaching. If you haven't read Teaching to Transgress, I'm also going to plug that one for you. But the one we used in this particular one is her writings on love. And love is the practice of freedom. And love is uniquely changing how we approach things. And if we think about love at the forefront, all of our actions are different. And part of why we continue to oppress peoples and part of the reason that we continue to have problems is because we're not using that framework of love. Patricia Hill Collins is another um, person, another woman who is Black woman who has written a lot on feminism and Black womanism and how Black women's safe spaces were never meant to be a way of life. And if we change that and make that and center that, we can transform the entire world because it doesn't just hurt Black queer women when we oppress them, it hurts everyone. So to recruit for this study, you'll see our recruitment poster to the side there um, The the lovely Dr. Williams created for us, who isn't on this call today, but she should be noted in all of the work here because she's fabulous um, and did a lot of stuff on this study. So we used a chain referral method. We used a lot of social media, all of the social medias, including uh, the open source ones of Mastodon and Pillowfort. Um, and we did identity based, we specifically used identity based community groups, support groups, resource centers and organizations, both on social media and brick and mortar ones. We made sure that everyone identified as a black queer woman and um, we also had ensured that, that they had graduated from a university within the last uh, year. So when we're talking about our methodology, um, I think it's really important to note that over the years, there's been several types of different qualitative methodologies, um, photo elicited interviews, live streaming. Um, 
those are things that definitely occur through the collection of social media. But what we wanted to do was try to bring to for bring to the forefront a, a different way of approaching our methodology. And so when we thought about um, artifact elicited interviews, I mean, it was it was just really it just came to us really naturally, and it was just a better. We just thought, hey, why not? Um, New methods must be tested to further decolonize qualitative research and meet participants just where they are. And so that was what we really wanted to put forth in this idea of thinking about the methodology. Um, this study asked participants to find three to six artifacts from their time in graduate school. So those artifacts could be songs, they could be pictures. Um, we definitely asked a combination of the pictures um, and the songs. I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Lizzie right now um, and if anybody is hearing me saying Dr. Lizzie, it's because we also have the po podcast coloring outside the memos. I have to plug that while we're in the middle of this. Um, but we do talk about qualitative research. Um, <clears throat> but getting back to why people are here. <laughs> um, when we were talking about the songs, you know, we were asking the participants, what is your liberation song? You know, what what helped you get through? Um, and so that really was important to us. The interviews were conducted with, as again, you're going to hear us repeat the number 19, 19 participants um, between the ages of 22 and 59 to understand this methodology. Um, oops. Um, <clears throat> while this method is similar to photo listed interviews, the unique allowance of documents and other artifacts allows participants to be more flexible in preparation for the interview and a richer, discuss richer discussion um, during the interview process. So the artifact, like, so when we say artifact, what does this really mean? And we define this as a meaning of um, anything that's representative of the participants, identities and experiences in higher within higher education. So what we did was we first had the artifact types, which we're pioneering this idea of a neutral artifact, a stress stress artifact, and a resilience artifact. So anytime somebody presented their artifact to us, we're like, so what does this represent to you? Was it neutral, stress, or resilience? And then we also went back and defined this ourselves. And then there was also the interviewing structure. This is a shared power. So there's a storytelling where the participant chooses to, to sorry, the participant choose, chose the order of their artifacts and share how they are related to their educational experience one by one. And then there's the conversational piece. So after the participant shares the story of their artifacts, the interviewer engages in a discussion about the participant, asking additional questions related to the identity, challenges, micro and macro aggressions, educational journey, emotional emotion, intersectional experiences, and the role of the Title IX office. So again, these are two, it sounds like it's one and the same, but it's actually not um, with the interview structure. Again, this really allows the participant to share their experience and, and they're telling us, and then we can come back around and say, so tell us a little bit more. So when we're talking about the Analytic positionality, and if you listen to Coloring Outside the Memos, you'll hear a, um, a session on positionality statement. Um, there's the consider an inter, consider the inter intersections, the attendance to intersectional identities um, as experiences, lived experiences, name sections as unapologetic naming of structures and of, of oppression, and their centering of joy, because all of this doesn't have to be depressing. So as researchers, it's important for us to critically reflect on the positionality as we engage in our work. By positionality, I mean thinking about how our identities experience backgrounds, privileges, and beliefs shape and influence our research. So after considering our worldview lens as researchers, there are, there are these three positions or stances that we found essential to take when going through the process of analyzing our data. Um, so the first is to consider the intersections of by giving attention to Black queen wisdom, or excuse me, Black queen women's intersectional identities and lived experiences as a black, as a black queen, as a black queer woman. I'm thinking that's a black queen, of course. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I mean, it is. First. You're right. I know. I am right. I am right. Um, 
as, <laughs> as I'm not black queer first, black first or queer second and woman third, I'm simultaneously all of these things at once. Um, and how these identities are interwoven together matters and impacts how I'm treated and how I experience and navigate the world. So how we are careful um, to treat participants' identities as holistic and, re and recognizing that the single identity analysis can be captured in single issues, missing opportunities for nuance in Black queer women's experiences with oppression and resilience. Then second, with the name systems, and I know I just went through these already, but just to identify, um, with the name systems, there were unapologetic in naming the systems and structures of oppression and the power and how they shape Black queer and queen um, women's lives. We understand that all too often instances of racism, heterosexism, sexism, and trans anti-trans sentiment go unnoticed, silenced, and ignored. We call these things, we call things what they are, and in the process, call others in the conversation with us to make racial healing, feminist values, and the queer liberation foundation in higher ed. And finally, as I said before, we're centering on on not just black joy, but centering on joy in our analysis. So all too often the research on black queer folks of color only talks about disparities and disadvantages and trauma. So in this particular research, we really wanted to center on joy. And so that was the beauty of bringing in the photos and the songs. So this is how we analyze our, our analysis. We use broad the thematic analysis to analyze our data. And I'll go through this really quickly, just highlighting the broad overview of our steps. We first familiarize ourselves with the data by reading each transcript, um, discussing our initial thoughts with each other in our weekly meetings. And we did have weekly meetings. We <laughs> and noting our initial understandings of the data. And after this, we created a code book and applied the codes to the transcripts and categorized the data and pulled out meaningful in, um, excerpts. Then we began to search for themes by looking for patterns across the coded excerpts. And after reviewing our initial themes, we finalized them by defining name and naming them. And then while we are not yet at the point of writing our manuscript, we will soon be there because this is a process and we will sure um, be sure to share that with you once it's published. And as I said before, we will be presenting our research um, at a conference coming up in November. So Dr. Lizzie. Sorry, uh, responding to a text there. So our first theme was, I felt alone on safe campuses, academic abuse in the culture of science. So in this theme, we had many participants tell us about how they felt alone, how they felt not seen on campus, how they had to navigate spaces um, without all of the support that they may have wanted, how stressful and challenging um, that loneliness was. For those of you who are in psychology, who are in social work, who are in other helping professions, or even for those of you who are faculty and who have paid attention to your student needs, you know that belongingness and feeling needed is a critical component of how we understand feeling content, feeling um, accepted, feeling supported, navigating life with resiliency. Um, all of that is important. There are a lot of theories on that. There's a lot of academic work on that. And so we know feeling alone is a particularly challenging place for people to be. Now, because uh, Dr. Tiffany and I are qualitative researchers, we like to give you big, long quotes to tell you about our data. We're not going to give you a bunch of charts and tables in this, but we will give you a lot of words. We won't read all of those words in their fullness to you, but we encourage you while we're talking through these, if you want to read those slides or to go back and look at the recording and pause it and to read these words. These words are really important to us. We have included with many of our sample quotes, uh, pictures of the artifacts that people sent in. They are deeply important to the participants. Um, we do ask you that you do not share those um, pictures with other people. So 
Uh, with this, uh, the first quote here comes from Kenya, and I will not read all of it, but I do want to specifically note that she was a queer cis woman, um, and she was at the PhD level. Again, remember that we had people from all levels, so PhD, masters, and bachelors. Um, and so Kenya talks about several things about how she had been triggered by committee members and how committee members were just not following along with her um, and giving her a really hard time, how they were critiquing her in ways that her peers were not being critiqued. And then she ends with this bit at the bottom. And I told him afterwards, you failed to protect me. I wonder if it's about being a Black femme. Now, for those of you in the audience who have marginalized identities, you can hear the pain in those words and you can hear the depth of those words. For those of you who have more privileged identities in the audience, you might not hear that. But that failing to protect is a huge issue, particularly when it was promised to Kenya. And this is the chair that she's having this conversation with after her thesis defense which is a really big and stressful event. And so for her, that was a huge thing. And then she had to ask herself, was this because of my identities or was this because of something else? And that is a really challenging place to be. Our next theme is who do they protect unjust and unsupportive Title IX procedures? Um, given participants' expansive experiences with abuse, retaliation, sexual violence, and intersectional, uh, intersectional oppression, we wondered if ever participants sought out the Title IX office or chose to, to file a report. And again, as Dr. Lizzie said, we're not going to read the entire quote. Um, there's several quotes, so I am breaking all um, PowerPoint rules here. <laughs> Please don't hold it against me. Um, but in this particular quote by Olivia, who is a lesbian, queer, cis woman who is in the PhD program, Olivia stated, I tried to tell you, but no one I wanted, no one, mm, I tried to tell you, but no one wanted to believe me because she painted it like I was crazy. I was hurt. My heart was hurt. I was abused. The participants who decided to report their incidents to Title IX often experienced further victimization and disbelief about their experiences. For instance, as I just shared with you about Olivia's experience. And again, this is about um, Olivia being emotionally, mentally, and financially abused by her supervisor in grad school, yet when she reported this to the Title IX office, this was her experience. Many participants did not view the Title IX office as a resource highlighting that their procedures and processes were performative, traumatic, and unjust. Naomi shared, oh, Naomi read, um, said, they're performative. I feel like most Title IX offices at universities are there to protect the university and not protect students. Similarly, um, next person, Sloth, who reported two separate incidents to Title IX said, Title IX is always messy and often re-traumatizes people. You can get access to counseling or whatever, but I don't think that these processes can provide anything for approaching justice. Other participants were unaware the Title IX office existed, yet discussed that they off they that they even, if they would have known about it, that they wouldn't have gone because of higher ed spaces fail to protect Black queer women. So how could Title IX be different? After sharing with Alicia that Title IX office is there and its purpose, she mentioned, based on all my experiences and having dealt with this stuff or for so many years, I have no faith that there will be any type of justice. I wouldn't go to any institutional office or space because those spaces they're not exempt from all racism and sexism and homophobia. So that so, just, kind of, I'm sorry. So that just kind of gives you an idea, a little bit about what these experiences were from just going into Title IX offices. And I know here at AU, I'm going to go back. 
I know here at AU, we've been talking a lot about our Title IX office um, and what we can do differently. But just for us to all keep in mind, like these are experiences and these are women from very, or individuals from very different walks of life. Um, as we said, 19 participants from all across the country and they're saying the same thing. Go ahead, Dr. Lizzie. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, please. Um, I'm sorry for interrupting. So thank you for that, uh, Dr. Tiffany. So theme three, I see myself in you. Representative mentorship as transformative. So this is the part of the interviews that we're getting into not just all of the trauma, but also the joy that uh, the Black queer women experience. And it's important to note here, let me stop and because I didn't say this earlier, and I want to specifically mention it, when we have identifiers below the quotes, we did not put in Black. All of our participants identified as Black. Some identified throughout the diaspora and in various different ways, but we did not include that, um, all of their identifiers. But please note that all of these participants identified as Black. Go ahead. So here in this representative transformative mentorship, we are moving into this joy space. So Naomi, who's a bisexual cis woman who was at the bachelor's level, told us, and it's also important to note, let me also pause and say that everyone chose their own pseudonym, just in case we didn't say that before. They all chose these. Um, these are not our versions, and I, we even made them spell them. So we got the spelling right of how they wanted to be referred to. So um, and I'm going to actually read you a bit of Naomi's because I want you to hear her words because they're beautiful and I love her um, just pattern of how she expresses this. I was crying because she is the first Black professor I had at school and I'm going to her like, hey, I just wrote this paper about how I want a Black woman teacher who's queer and focuses on multiculturalism. And I'm like, here you are. And I was like, can, can I? tea or something or anything and then we ended up starting a research lab for queer people of color and working within that and so that definitely changed my direction of academia I actually started caring a little bit more about my work and then also kind of no longer shying away from including my own personal thoughts about race racism you know intersectionality and stuff like that in my papers so here we see this beautiful transformation of Naomi that for her, having a Black queer professor, a Black queer female professor, changed her entire direction in the academy. It made such a huge and profound impact on her that she realized that she not only had that visualization of what she wanted to do, but also space to try something new and to care a little bit harder and to work in a deeper level. And we all know that representation doesn't do everything, but it does do something. And it's important to note that. Our fourth theme is claiming my power, perseverance, and persistence in higher education. So I think it's important to note that despite the experiences of abuse, unsafe campuses, unsupportive Title IX offices, and the lack of mentors, participants were persistent in their pers pursuit of higher education degrees, and many had defining moments where they realized, named, claimed, and reclaimed their power, refusing to quit their program and celebrating their strength. So they often connected these defining moments to feeling power in their identities. So this is Jill, um, a lesbian, queer, cis woman who is in a PhD program. And Jill's artifact on this page is a photo of her purple cord from her graduation. And I'm going to read the part well, that's bolded and saying, every time I wanted to give up, something always pushed me into you can't give up. Somebody here needs you. And in the end, I realized that I needed it. It took me 11 years to finish my certificate. So I think that it's really important to know that despite everything, Jill finally succeeded. She achieved her goal. And I think that's something that's really, really important for us to note. Um, yes, doctoral programs can take forever and a day. Um, but you know, you, you, I mean, it's just really important to note that Jill succeeded. And so did a lot of our, our, all of our participants. 
So the results. So artifact elicited interviews produced dynamic, engaging, and thoughtful interviews. So some of the interviews lasted 90 minutes. And then I will take the ownership and say that I had the five-hour interview. Um, I love our participants, but it was my fault. <laughs> and so this one was a five-hour interview. Um, if you ever want to have a conversation about how to not have a five-hour interview, we can have that conversation offline. Um, methods allowed the participants to talk about their research prompts and come into interviews ready to discuss their experiences more fully and further were more aware of the trauma than they were otherwise might have been. So, I mean, again, by having the by having the that conversation and that storytelling and having them come prepared with the the artifacts they're not coming in cold the participants are not coming in cold they're coming in prepared to talk about their their experience and it was a completely different conversation i'm looking at dr lizzie right now i mean it was a very different experience than i've experienced in other studies that i've participated in um and, and so it just it just made it a little bit easier. That probably explains why my particular conversation was five hours long. Um, but it just made it a little bit easier. So as we're getting ready to wrap up here, or well, I mean, I guess we're halfway through, but as we're like moving into this space of what everything means, one of the things I want to pause and specifically note before we get to invitations is that we I wanted to jump back to our trauma point and just say that like as researchers um all of our research team identified as queer um we all identify as women um two of the three of us identify as black and with those identity markers and with the traumas we experienced um, leading into this, I think it's really vital to say that as we were doing this research, we each hit different walls at different points where that trauma bubbled up. And so one of the ways we navigated that, um, well, actually, let me just tell you a quick story because I think this is useful and I'll share this. This isn't this particular study, but it's of note and it's relevant. So in one of my previous research studies, there was one day where I was sitting at my computer and I was typing up notes and it was a research project that of several different types of abuse that I had experienced um, as a queer person, as somebody who's been sexually assaulted, as somebody who has experienced some reproductive health trauma. And it was a study on all of those things. And I was like, oh my gosh, why are my glasses so dirty? Like I can't see anything. So I take my glasses off and I'm rubbing them and I'm trying to clean them off and I get them all clean and I even use the liquid to clean them and I put them back on my face and I'm like wow it's still really fuzzy maybe my computer's really dusty so like I grab out a cloth and I clean off my computer and then I sit back down and I'm like it's still really like why can't I see anything and then I touch my face and I realize that my face is drenched and like my shirt is wet because I've been crying so hard while I was doing this like data analysis that I wasn't even conscious that I was crying and for some of you you're like woof I can relate to that and some of you can't, but what I will tell you is that's a mark of trauma and re-traumatizing and reliving that trauma. And sometimes it happens in ways you can name and you can know, and sometimes it happens in ways you don't know. So one of the things we all did for each other during this study was we would have a conversation at the beginning of every single team meeting every week of how are we doing? Is anger coming up for you? Is sadness coming up for you? Are you not able to sit down and do the work? Like what's coming up? How are you taking care of yourself? What do we need to do? Like, how can we support each other? How can we help each other? How can we name this? And by even naming the fact that this trauma is coming back up, how can we work through it or navigate it? Um, before I move fully away from that, Dr. Tiffany, is there any other thoughts you have on like how that trauma came up for you that you would like to share with folks or anything you would like to talk about about how we navigated that right I mean I think it was just really important that we identified that um 
we identified the trauma that we all experienced, if I can say that, um, because we were very honest with ourselves about what we had experienced. So for me, um, I had gone through a lot of, um, I had gone through abuse as a doctoral student. We probably should have put a trigger warning before this particular session, um, but here it is. Um, and and as a doctoral student, I had gone through a lot of abuse and from a faculty member. And so there was constantly a checking in, not just with my research team, but also with my therapeutic team being like, hey, Tiffany, you're doing this work. How are you feeling? And I think that's something that's really important when you're doing this particular type of work um, is being able to check in with yourself. And again, this is that third um, session objective that we're trying to really address is how do you how do you attend to the trauma as a researcher um, when doing this type of work? Um, and when you have a supportive team, it's just really, it makes it a lot easier to, to be able to talk it out. Um, I would say that that's probably one of the reasons why it took, excuse me, it took us as long as it has and it's taken us as long as it has to to complete this particular study. Um, because when we delve into the the interviews, sometimes you're in it and you have to say, you have to take a moment. You have to, and that moment, maybe an hour, maybe a two hours, maybe a week, because that particular interview is is re-traumatizing. And, and it's just really hard. It just is really hard. So I think as qualitative researchers, we're just more, we're not more, but we are in tune to what's going on with us. Um, not knocking our fellow quant nor our fellow mixed methodologist, but we try to be in tune with what's going on with ourselves. Um, yeah, and I think just hearing their stories, um, the participant stories, it reminded me that we have so much work to do um, in higher ed. Yeah, and that's a really nice transition to this invitation. So as we're leaving you, we didn't want to leave you with a standard discussion. Um, or conclusions, because this work really calls specifically when we're presenting it to university folks, invitations. So we wanted to offer you a few different invitations. The first one is for administration. So first and foremost, hire, retain, promote, and support Black queer women scholars. Now, I want to be specific, and we all want to be specific in this, that it does not begin the beginning, middle, and end is not with hiring uh, Black queer women scholars. It also has to be, has to be in order to retain and promote them and support them, a shift from performative allyship to intentional advocacy. So what does that mean? If you are doing DEI work or Jedi work or edgy work or however you want to phrase uh, that term, you cannot just check off a box and say, great, we had something during February on Black scholars and we had something during June on queer scholars. That is not allyship. That is performative. Intentional advocacy it means supporting the full person and seeing them as full human beings and not simply as identities. Third, consider who your policies are designed to protect. Um, and when I say that, I mean, have a really hard look in the mirror of who are we actually promoting? Um, I was at a training just last week where somebody said, well, we looked at our data and we thought, well, we have a lot of Black scholars here. And then we realized suddenly that only men were getting promoted in five years. Uh, white men were getting promoted in five years. White women were getting promoted in seven to eight years. And Black women were getting promoted in 11 to 12 years for tenure. You have to look at those things, not only what the policy is, but also how that is being enacted. And finally, consider the speakers and guests invited to campus. Who are they? Do they reflect your population? Do they not? Do people not want to come to your campus because it is not a safe space for them? These are all very important markers that future potential students will look for, future potential faculty and staff will look for before they agree to work for you. 
So invitations to student support centers, um, transforming the Title IX office. So restorative justice and accountability as the foundation of the Title IX office. So as you heard um, in the conversation with Naomi, um, Sloth, Olivia, and I now I'm forgetting the fourth person, but um, they all talked about the Title IX office and how the Title IX office was not a supportive place. So we really need to think about how we need to restructure and challenge how people not just see the Title IX office, but how they experience the Title IX office. Um, cultivate empathy, so trauma-informed care, connection, and communication approaches. So it is really important for me to say this, Dr. Lizzie and I and Deanna, Dr. Deanna Williams, the three of us are not psychiatrists. We are not psychologists. I'm going to repeat. We are not psychiatrists. We are not psychologists. We are qualitative researchers. So having said all of that, um, it's just really important to cultivate a, a, a space of empathy when doing this kind of work um, and working with people, period. Um, nurture belonging. C um, curate thoughtful spaces of community, rest, and healing. Rest is important. Naps are important. Okay, <laughs> let me just say that, okay? Naps are important. Cultivating a space of community and healing is important. Taking a moment and putting yourself in timeout, that is all very, very, very important. Invitations for faculty and staff. Commit to intentional and authentic mentorship and sponsorship of Black queer women students. And again, just like we talked about with administration, I know how hard it is to be a faculty member. I promise you I do. Uh, but that does not just mean bringing in Black queer female PhD students. It means fully supporting them. You cannot just bring them in and think that's enough. Um, uh, several of my colleagues talk about their PhD experiences um, who are Black queer Black queer women will say, well, during my PhD, all of the white colleagues got these invitations to conferences and I didn't. They got funding from my our similar mentor for these things and I didn't. They got introduced to people and I didn't. And be really authentic. Look at yourself in the mirror and see what you're doing and what you're not doing. Um, read, cite, teach, discuss the work of Black queer women in the classroom as the rule, not the exception. You will notice that one of the things I intentionally did when we were doing the introduction and talking about who we were using for theorists is that I said, this is a Black queer woman. I put up, we put up some pictures of them, right? That is a really good way in the classroom to help your students see themselves. Um, consider speakers and guests who you invite to your classroom. Um, consider the readings that you're using. Consider the topics and dominant narratives being centered. As a public health person, I spend a lot of my teaching time talking about disparity. And one of the things I'm focusing on this year is how do I bring in resiliency and joy? How do I make people think that um, groups who have oppression and marginalization are not just sitting there going, oh my God, I have this health condition and this health condition and this health condition and my life is terrible. It's not. There's lots of joy and beauty in every community, and that's important to center as well. So our communal invitation is to ask everybody to trust and listen to Black queer women. If you have not figured that out, you have been sitting in the wrong presentation, but, or maybe you're sitting in the right presentation. I don't know, but you need to make <laughs> sure that you trust and listen to Black queer women. I mean, that's something that's really important. Yeah. Um, and finally, we want to end with this beautiful quote. You have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're okay. Um Angela Davis is another Black woman who is beautiful and has a, written a lot of beautiful works. If you haven't read her, go read her. Um, and I think this is important because a lot of times in these kind of conversations, people get stuck on, well, what do I do or how do I do it? Or this is so hard or it's challenging or whatever. And yeah, it's all of those things. But if you don't act as if it's possible to radically transform the world, then we're going to be having the same conversation again 
in one year, in five years, in 10 years, in 50 years. We have to make a difference and we can do it and you can do it and we believe in you. So our contact information is down below. As Dr. Lizzie said, I'm here at American. Um, Dr. Lizzie is, is at University at Buffalo. <laughs> um, and Dr. Deanna Williams is at Multicare um, in, located in Seattle. Washington State. In, yeah, oh, sorry, in Seattle. Um, so just that is our contact information. Somebody had asked me, I'm going to stop sharing. Somebody had asked in the chat, and Dr. Lizzie, I don't think you got this, but somebody oh. had asked um, what conference we would be presenting at. And I wanted to give you the floor really quickly to kind of tell people about the conference that we're going to be presenting at. Sure, happy to. Uh, so the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality is a conference um, and a society, a professional society that has been around for a long, long time. Um, they have been around since the seventies, I want to say. Um, and before that they were part of another organization, not important. I don't need to give you that history, but I will just say that it's been around for a long time and they are a relatively small conference of about two to 400 people. Um, and it happened, they have an annual meeting every year in November and the study of sexuality is broad. It encompasses identity. It encompasses reproductive behaviors. It encompasses, um, communicable diseases and infectious diseases. It encompasses uh, pleasure and joy. It uncover, uh, encompasses sexual assault and violence and harassment, um, protective behaviors, preventive behaviors, and like I said, identity. And so we fit into the identity piece of it. And it is a place where we're so excited to be presenting. It is... Um, a great conference. I could go on for days about it, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. So at this time, um, we wanted to open it up to folks to just ask any questions, let it be about the research, let it be about um, connecting with the participants, maybe how long it took us to recruit, um, <laughs> anything um, that you may have questions about this particular presentation, we'd be willing to share with you.